actions that we have taken, and also, Lord, those things that, that we have failed to do, that you have placed as opportunities before us in this past week. And, Lord, we confess that at times we have closed our eyes to what you would have us to do or to say. Father, we failed to love you above all in our life, and we failed to love others even as we love ourselves. And so we confess to you who we are. And in that, Lord, we plead for your grace. Father, we plead for your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. And let's uh, respond with a song of confession, also a song of assurance that God indeed hears our confession and responds to us before the throne of God above. stand before God, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. What an amazing salvation God makes known to us and calls us to. So how does God want us to respond to his grace? How does he desire for us to live as a people who have experienced that grace that he offers through Jesus? We hear God's guide for living from Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we prepare to open God's word, let's come to him in prayer. Father, we pray today that you would encourage us by your word. We pray that as we read it, as we hear you speak to us, that we may uh, understand more who you are and also, Lord, your will for us. Lord, we thank you for your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading uh, Luke 15, verses 11 through 24. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. It says, Jesus continued. He continued telling the parables, continued uh, with the theme of uh, the lost and what that, uh, uh, what that means, God's grace and finding the lost. There was the lost sheep, the lost coin. And now he continues. He said there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he, the father, divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to feed to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Thus far the reading of God's word. When one looks, takes an overview, an overlook of uh, Scripture, what you see out there is that overarching outline of, of uh, sin, salvation, and service. It's the outline of the book of Romans. It's also the outline of the Heidelberg Catechism. But it's uh, an outline that, that generally tells us we have a problem. It tells us the answer and then also how we can respond to that answer that we have from God to the problem. But if we never see the problem, if we never get to a place where we realize that we have to look in a certain direction in order to have that problem taken care of, if we never look for that answer, we're never going to be able to respond, at least not respond as God calls us to. 
God's grace is seen in bringing us to a place where we see we have a problem so that we can turn to him. Well, as I thought about that, how that happens, I, I remember uh, uh, most recently I was chaplain at a nursing home in Waupon, Wisconsin, and I remember reminiscing at often um, over many different subjects, but reminiscing with some of the older farmers at the home, and, and they would talk about their uh, dairy farms that they had or grew up on. And, and I remember talking with them about our hog farms in northwest Iowa. When my wife and I were first married, we farmed outside of Sioux Center here, worked for Wilma Rensing for a couple of years. And, and I would tell them, I said, you know, uh, when you're dealing with hogs, as I recall, now it's been a long time ago, so I probably don't recall everything correctly, but I recall having uh, one of the most useful things around was having a hog board, or what I called a hog board, that uh, board, I don't know, three by five with some hand holds in it. And basically, if you wanted the hogs to go in a certain direction, you had to convince them that that was the only direction to go. If they could see light or if they could be able to, to uh, turn around uh, in another direction, they would. And, and if that hog board would get worn around the edges, they would get their snout under it and push because they would want to go in a different direction. But the trick was sliding that board, keeping it along so that it was dark and the only direction they could see was the direction that you wanted them to go. Uh, and that's the direction, theoretically, they would go. Well, I think Scripture teaches a principle similar to that. Uh, there, there's not a lot of options for us to look at spiritually. We, we may try a lot of things. We may think there's a lot of different ways to solve problems that we have in our life or that we think we have. But in the end, God assures us there's only one direction. Those doors are closed. Uh, they, they aren't open for us. We have a problem with sin. It tells us that. And it keeps telling us that over and over. And no matter how hard we try to hide it, no matter if we try to deny it or rationalize it, it's going to remain a problem until we look in the direction that God is pointing us to look at. And if we think we can fix it on our own, we're wrong. If we can think we can fix it with our good intentions, uh, we can't. If we think that we can rely on the fact that, that we've been baptized or we stockpile points by going to church or learning our lessons, we, uh, it, we can't fix it with those ways. Those aren't an option for us to look at. We, we cannot bank on being... Uh, a, a person that comes from a good family, uh, coming from a, a good family, will not take care of this problem. Uh, we can't hide behind the fact that, that, that we say, well, I didn't know, or, or even in our day and age saying, well, that the law allows it, so it must be okay. The truth is, uh, sin is not normal and good, even if the laws say it is. Sin is sin, and sin is the problem and that's the direction that we need to realize that we're in. And that's where our scripture passage is in Luke 15. The prodigal son, the son, didn't even want to admit that his actions were showing any kind of a problem. Uh, and he, he was in denial. He was on his high horse. He wanted what he wanted, and he thought he could fix life and do life just as he liked. He was in denial until all the props began to be kicked out from underneath him. Uh, one at a time, those props were gone. He hit bottom. All the doors that he thought he could go through to take care of his life, to live life, they were closed. And he finally came to the point of realizing that the problem was, was that he was a sinner, that he had a problem. And it wasn't a very flattering place to find himself. It's not a very flattering place to find ourselves when we get there. But yet that's where the Bible keeps telling us that we are. We're sinful from the time our mother conceived us. We're prone to all nature of evil, uh, seeking answers by our own understanding instead of looking to God and his wisdom. We do all those things. We're sinners. We have a sinful nature. We cannot do anything 
to save ourselves, we cannot do anything ourselves to fix the problem, period. That's where we're at. But you know, some would say, but you know, if that's true, if we're conceived in sin, if sin is a problem our whole life, if, if, if that's the fact, well then God must not be very fair. It isn't very fair of God to force us to see that we're sinners. I mean, he makes the rules, but it's impossible for us to live up to those rules. It's impossible for us to keep them perfectly. How can that be fair? And they ask if we really think God is going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. He made us. He supposedly loves us. Is he really going to punish our sin if that's a fact of life? That's who we are if we can't help it. Won't he let it slide? Won't God, because of that fact, maybe wink at some of our sin and say, well, you know, it, it's not so bad, it's not so serious. A lot of people are banking on that. A lot of people think, you know, that's true, but, you know, in the end, God's going to let me slip in the back door. And it's sad because that's not the answer that the Bible gives us. The answer that keeps coming back is sin is a problem. And sin will be punished because God is a just God. It's going to be punished because God is perfect. God is holy. Uh, the, the scripture, that, that board, keeps sliding along beside us, blocking all those other options that we think should be there. God will not wink at our sin. And that's where we need to be before we can really look up and see the right direction, the direction that, that God wants us to look in. And once we're there we realize that, that the option left open to us, the only direction that we can face, is God's grace. It's God's mercy, and it's Jesus. Grace leads us to a place where we do see that it isn't fair what's happening, but the fairness isn't on our part. The unfairness is what happens to God, to the Father. That's the story of the prodigal son, that... That's our story. It's the Father who isn't treated fairly. It's God who isn't treated fairly. And so the problem is caused by the Son. And the grace, the mercy, is shown by the Father. We see it in the actions. We see it in the attitude of the Son. He says, give me my inheritance. And those listening to Jesus as he was talking, they would understand what the son was really saying. Uh, what he was saying behind those words was, Father, I would just as soon you were dead. Give me what I want. It's like us saying today, God, save me, die on the cross for me, but then bug off. I really don't want anything to do with you. I really don't want you in my life but I do like having you as a backup plan. I do like knowing that, you know, I think when I die, there, there, there's heaven, there's a place for me to go, but, but Father, I would just as soon you were dead. And so the son in Jesus' story, the son was showing his misery. He was showing by his actions where he really was. He was separating himself from, from the one who loved him. He was separating himself from the only one who could help him. And then the story goes down that expected path. The Jewish audience, they'd be nodding their heads in agreement as Jesus tells the story as it unfolds. He ended up in a far place. He found himself feeding pigs, the bottom of the barrel, as far as where good Jewish boys would ever want to find themselves. And then he hits bottom. Uh, when he thinks that the food the pigs are eating, that that food even looks pretty good, good enough to eat. And, and they would be nodding their heads. They'd be saying, yep, 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 there you go. No good comes from leaving your father. No good comes from, uh, from acting that way. It, you should have known, wishing he was dead. In their minds, the son was on the road to hell. And, and just as he deserved, that's where he was headed. Fair and square, the end of the story for them. It's justice. It's what they expected. 
but yet justice alone, getting what he deserves, is not where Jesus ends the story. He's showing us, for that's where we are as well. Like we said, every other option is closed. He's showing us that in the pig pen is where we need to see ourselves, admitting that we blew it, acknowledging that, that we lusted after the answers of this world, being happy is the most important. Yeah, it's good to know Jesus saves, but, but give me some money in the bank. That's, that's, where, that's where I really want to be, satisfying our, our, our lusts, our flesh, all of it is where we need to realize that we are or were. And knowing that justice demands that that's where we stay. Justice says that's what you deserve, headed for hell. So, so really the truth is justice is served when we know we're sinful and cannot save ourselves, that we've hit bottom. And the board comes down again and, and we're forced again to look in another direction. And we're forced to look in God's direction. And verse 17 shows where the young man looked in that direction. It says it this way, that the son came to his senses. His heart wakes up. He, he understands the mess that he's in. He, he understands that he's made that mess himself. He came to his senses. It indicates that, that, that he was out of it before, that, that he wasn't. Uh, awake, that he wasn't um, with it, like, like the boxer's trainer who comes in with the smelling salts or, or water in the face of a person who faints away. Uh, he came to. You wake up. I don't know if you've ever, ever fainted, but uh, uh, I, I had it once where, where I fainted, I think once in my life, where you come around and you wonder how you got there. But uh, when I was in college, I drove school bus in Grand Rapids, and, and I remember delivering a van to a, a, another driver's house, and an, another driver was picking me up. And I parked in front of her house, got out of the van, was going to run the keys up to her back door, and I came around the back of the van, and, and you, you know what was sticking out of the back of the van, a trailer hitch about that far, and I hit my shin square on that hitch, and I hobbled up to the door, rang the doorbell, and the next thing I remember is she's over me saying, are you okay? And I had to think, where was I? Uh, it's like I was out of it. And then I came to my senses, watch out for trailer hitches. Uh, you realize where you're at. Well, the son in the story came too. He was still in the same place. He still had a problem. He was still in the pig pen, but, but his vision, his hope, his heart was able to see beyond where he was. And spiritually, it's God who wakes us up. It's God who, who quickens our heart to see that there's more to this life, that, that there's more to this life than our efforts to fix things, that, that there's hope beyond the pig pen. And what that is, that hope, even though he's still in the, in the pig pen, that hope is mercy. That hope is God's grace. In the story, we see the son was enlivened by his response. He, he had still been, been thinking he could handle things on his own, or had he been thinking that, his response would not have been what it was. If he thought he could handle things on his own, he, he probably would have said, boy, this is crazy. My father has money. He's still well off, and here I am, drooling over pig slop. Or, or, or he could have said, you know, my old man was a pushover before. I bet you if I go back, I bet you he would welcome me to his table again. No, he woke up, he came to his senses, and it showed in his heart who he really was. A, a poor, pathetic excuse of a son who had no delusions that, that he deserved anything from his father whom he had wronged. He realized he had a problem. And the only option for him to return to his father, where he desperately then wanted to be, the only option was to come under the mercy of his father. Not the father's justice. That would have put him receiving what he deserved. 
but is coming under his mercy. And he confessed he didn't deserve mercy, but yet mercy was his only hope. Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. Father, I, I don't even deserve to be called one of your servant slaves. Have mercy on me. I, I'm not demanding anything. I'm only seeking your mercy. And, and when we see ourselves right there needing not deserving, but needing mercy, then this amazing picture of God's grace, it can touch us where we're at. It can affect our life today. The, the father who never stopped looking for his son's return, the father sees him. He's still a long way off, but he sees him. And he was waiting for this day. He lost sleep sitting into the wee hours of the morning, wondering, I wonder if tomorrow my son would return. And then finally, he once again looks up and he squints, looking into the dis distance, and he sees a speck way off. And he looks again and he wonders, could it be? Could it be? And the person gets closer and the father sees the son that, that he's always loved. But the, the prideful demeanor is gone. There, there's a humbleness in his step. But he knows it's his son, and so the father takes off running. He throws off all protocol. He, he hikes up his garments, and with tears in his eyes, he runs. He runs to embrace the son. Can you see that picture? Because that's a picture of God's mercy. His mercy for you, his mercy for me, that God loves us. God runs to us. God welcomes us his children, who realize that the only option is his mercy. It's the only option left for us. Like pigs behind the board, we lift our head and we see God. And we see and seek his mercy. That's amazing love. It's amazing mercy that God shows because God's justice calls for us to be beaten. It calls for us to be destroyed and sent away. And when I thought about that, you know, it's interesting that in reality, it isn't so much that we're saved from sin. We continue to struggle with sin, but, but we're saved from God's wrath against sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. God sent Jesus then to pay the price for our sin, and God hurled his wrath, his judgment against Jesus instead of against us. And God runs to meet and embrace all those who put their trust in Jesus to take away their sin, who put our trust in God. When we look in the right direction, what we keep running into is God's grace. And then God's word, God's spirit, keeps us from being satisfied in the pig pen. God keeps directing us so that we, we keep our eyes on him. It's then that we realize that it's also God's mercy that woke us up in the first place, that brings us to our senses, that enables us to say, I'm going to set out and go back to my father. That's a confession that leads to change in our life. That's what makes it impossible for us to live thinking that we can sin just so that God's grace, that God's mercy can abound. Instead, we desire to live in a way that, that shows our love to the Father, in a way that brings sorrow to our hearts when we find ourselves back in the pig pen, back in that place where we don't want to be. So indeed, sin is the problem. It keeps us from God. It, it causes problems in our life. It causes problems with each other. But God's grace is seen when we see the Father running to welcome us home. A grace then that affects our relationship with him, that affects our life in the world today, and that affects our eternity with God. The Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 4 I'd like to read those question and answers because it, it, it expresses that truth in this way. Lord's Day 4 comes at the end of the, the section in the catechism that describes the problem, the misery that we're in, just before it launches into that uh, whole section of teaching us about God's deliverance and how he does that. So question and answer 9 says, but, but 
doesn't God do us an injustice by requiring in the law what we are unable to do? That's that question. But God's not fair if he's going to require us to live in a way that, that's holy because we can't do it. And the answer is no, it's not an injustice. God created human beings with the ability to keep the law, but they, however, provoked by the devil, in willful disobedience, they robbed themselves and all their descendants of these gifts. Okay, so we are sinful. But question 10 says, does God permit such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? Really, that's saying if we can't help it, surely he's going to wink at our sin, right? Uh, it, it will be allowed, you know, we'll be allowed to slide in through the back door, right? Is he going to not permit any rebellion? And the answer is certainly not. God is terribly angry with the sin we are born with as well as the sins we personally commit. As a just judge, God will punish those sins both now and and in eternity, having declared cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. And then finally, question 11. And this question you, you have to read after those others, after 9 and 10, you read it in a way that's pleading, in a way that says, is there anything beyond then where we're at? I love the question because it forces us to look only in one direction. But isn't God also merciful? And the answer is God is certainly merciful, but also just. God's justice demands that sin committed against his supreme majesty is be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. Isn't God merciful? Sin is a problem, and then the catechism goes into that whole section of God's deliverance, his mercy, shown to us in Jesus Christ. God is indeed merciful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for being a God who comes to us in mercy. Lord, we need your grace, your mercy. There's no other place to turn and so we thank you for closing doors so that we could come to our senses, so that we could see you as the answer, the only answer to the problem that we have in life and even for eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond with uh, Psalter number 260, not what my hands have done. The three stanzas will stand as we sing number 260.
be seated. Let's come before God in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for who you are. We, we praise you, we adore you for who you are. You indeed are God who has created all things. The earth is yours, everything in it. Lord, every creature, every creation, every person created in your image, it's you who, who did it. It's you who, who founded this earth, who established it. And so, Lord, we, we realize who you are, and we seek your presence. And we read in your word that, that only those whose hands are clean, only those whose hearts are pure, only those who trust in you alone can come into your presence. And so, Lord, we declare that trust in you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, we thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Father, for, uh, for healing us spiritually. We thank you for uh, forgiving our sins. Father, we do indeed seek you in your face, you the King of glory. So enter our lives, uh, have control, have complete power over our hearts, our minds, Lord, our souls. And so we thank you for your creation. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for life that we can enjoy, for family and relationships. Lord, we thank you for uh, the modern abilities that, that you give us to be able to travel, even to see loved ones who may be miles away or, or, or to see them electronically. Lord, what a joy to, uh, to watch as sometimes grandchildren and and others uh, grow up as they uh, live life and to be able to see that. It's truly amazing. And we thank you for some of those modern abilities. Lord, we, uh, we give you thanks for, uh, for rain that comes in due season, and we pray for that blessing of rain to, to, to fall as it's needed. Lord, we thank you for the crops that we see in the field, and, and we anticipate the, uh, uh, the harvest that those crops represent. And also, Lord, we anticipate the blessing, uh, even financial blessing, that they represent for uh, not only those crops, but for the businesses and uh, not only the farmers, but the uh, other manufacturing places. And, and Father, for the uh, ability that that gives us to share with others, to give back to you and to see your kingdom advanced in ways that that give you honor and glory. So, Lord, we pray for those that, that do struggle. We pray for those that are underemployed or, or unemployed, and we ask that uh, you would um, be leading, be guiding, and we ask for your blessing upon work. Lord, we, uh, uh, we thank you, too, for making us your children, for making us part of your body, here on earth, that body universal, a body that, uh, that expands not only through the ages, but also around the world of people that worship you. And so we pray, especially today, for those that uh, find themselves persecuted by others because of their faith. And we pray for brothers and sisters in places that, that some are even losing their life because of their faith in you. And we ask, Lord, for their safety, but Father, even more than that, we ask that their faith be strong, and even in their situations, that you would strengthen our faith as well. And so we pray for your body, for our brothers and sisters in many different places. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this congregation and, and this community, and we pray for uh, all of those churches in this community where your word goes forth over the pulpits. Lord, we pray that, as you have promised, that that word would uh, accomplish all that you set out for it to do. We pray especially for a Covenant Christian Reformed Church this morning, for Pastor Corey, and for that congregation as, as they, too, uh, seek to follow you and live your will in the world today. Lord, we, uh, we do pray for those that, uh, 
that need you in a special way. We thank you for health and for strength, and we thank you for healing where, uh, where that has happened. But we pray, Lord, we, for uh, Gertrude Brook this morning as uh, she is in rehab from her broken hip, and we pray that you would uh, give her the strength and the healing that she needs. Lord, we pray for uh, Mary Ellen uh, Dulleslager and others who have had knee surgeries and are uh, experiencing your healing, and we pray for complete healing. Lord, we, uh, we thank you that uh, jo uh, Jolene Vermeer was also able to return home. And Father, our, our hearts also thank you for, for families and for those relationships. And our hearts go out to the Krugers and the miscarriage that, that they experienced. And, and Father, we, we mourn with them and we, uh, we think of, uh, of that loss of life uh, even before it entered the world. But Father, we, we thank you too that we do not grieve as those without hope, even in those situations. And so we ask for your, your presence, your strength, your peace uh, with this family and for all those that have experienced loss in, in recent uh, days, weeks, even years, where that spot uh, in their hearts is, is still raw, where it's still open. And Lord, we, uh, uh, we do pray uh, for others that perhaps had received uh, hard news in the past days, devastating news uh, for those in our circle of family or friends or uh, those uh, that we know, sometimes, Lord, it's news of, uh, uh, of disease that they never believed that, that they would hear. And so we pray, too, for healing. We pray for faith to be strengthened. Uh, we pray for comfort where that's needed. Father, we, we also thank you for opportunities that you give us, opportunities to, uh, to uh, do and to say things uh, in this world, opportunities that often you place in our path, and we pray that we might seize them in, in, uh, in being a witness and a testimony for you in how we act, how we work, uh, the words that we say. We pray, too, for those that have gone out from uh, familiar surroundings and places into other places. We think of the Sorens uh, today in Costa Rica and their teaching there that goes on. We ask for your blessing on that. We think of uh, Josh and Joni Garcia, the uh, Itzis in Ukraine, uh, Garcia's in Nicaragua, Lord, for the Kuipers in Mexico and Texas, and, and for others that, that perhaps we uh, support and know. Lord, we thank you for their service to you, and we thank you for our involvement in their lives and in their service. And so we pray your blessing on each one. We thank you for opportunities to be part of a, a church uh, broader than ourselves, where uh, missions can take place around the world and, and even at home. And so we pray for world and home missions. We pray, Lord, for a world renew and in those uh, situations where they find themselves, where disasters have struck, where people sometimes uh, feel like uh, life has just been kicked out from under them and, and they're, they're despairing. They don't know where to turn. And we pray that you would use uh, those organizations such as World Renew to bring them hope, uh, a true hope that focuses on you. Father, we do thank you for uh, opportunities to learn and for our schools, we uh, pray as they uh, already now get ready to uh, start a, another, another school year. We pray for teachers and for students. Um, even now, we pray that, uh, that your work, your spirit in their hearts would be preparing them for what they teach and what they learn, whether it be in uh, higher learning in colleges, uh, high school, uh, grade school, Lord, those uh, institutions that are Christian, uh, also those the public institutions. Lord, we, we pray for that learning to point people to yourself. Father, we pray for our nation as well this morning. We thank you for uh, those that serve in, in the armed forces, and we pray for uh, your blessing on, on their service and for your safety, as many are in harm's way. And Lord, as a nation, we uh, we confess our sins 
before you, our corporate sins. We, we repent of those sins and we would pray for your spirit to revive, to uh, make our nation great, not, Lord, for, uh, for its sake or even our sake, but so that your blessings might flow through us. We pray for those that rule over us, for our leaders, and ask that their ears and hearts uh, be open to, uh, to you and to your will. Father, this morning as we uh, prepare to bring our, our offerings, we uh, thank you for opportunities that this congregation has in this place, and we pray that you would bless these offerings for that work as well as the uh, education uh, of its children. We pray in your name, amen. At this time, our morning offerings will be received.
invite you to stand as we prepare to go to receive God's parting blessing. It's good to gather as God's people. It's good to worship together for a time. And as we go now, go with his blessing. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. We receive your blessing.